Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so, I am going to talk about Bayesian approaches to black box optimization. And sort of different from some of the other talks we had today, I'm basically going to give sort of a, a broad overview and then tell you about some, uh, so I'll try and motivate why you should be interested. And then I'll give you some problems with Bayesian optimization that uh, either you can solve, you can help me solve, someone will solve these problems. Um, okay. And uh, I, I should also say that after I, I tried to make this as general as possible and get rid of equations, and um, I'm not sure it even has to be Bayesian anymore. Uh, so if you're not interested in Bayesian uh, methods, then you can still listen. Um, okay, so what do I mean by uh, black box optimization? So by the name, first I mean it's just optimization. So I've got some function that I'm uh, interested in solving, f. I want to find the maximum of that. But uh, f is a black box. So really, the only thing that I can do is I can query its value, and I can't get any gradient or anything. I can just say f, what is the value at x? And it will give me back some, uh, some y value. And that y value. Uh, may even be corrupted by noise. So really what I have is at the end of the day, I have some box that I'm going to give it x's, I'm going to get back y's, and the function that I'm interested in optimizing is then going to be the expectation of those y's that sort of churn through the black box and come out. And in particular, I'm going I'm to do this sequentially. So I'll have some sequence of x's that um, I'm going to specify in some manner uh, in order to try and find the best value um, of f. OK, so before I sort of dive into this, a, a few examples. So one of the, the big ones that uh, has been sort of making waves recently due to some work by uh, Jasper uh, Snook and colleagues is in hyperparameter optimization. So f is, in some sense, the training loss for some machine learning algorithm. And we have some hard to set hyperparameters. So I may have uh, some other hyperparameters of the model that I can optimize, say the weights of a neural network or something like that, but uh, say the learning rate or some other parameters that are difficult to set, I can't get gradients from them. I can only sort of churn them through my model and then get back out the, uh, the training set error. Uh, those are the things that I'm interested in. So that, that, that uh, loss and then those hyperparameters, that's f and x. So in the setting of reinforcement learning or in learning to control, like uh, Carl talked about uh, earlier today, so f might be I set some of the parameters um, and I run my simulator. Or even I uh, run it in the real world and I get back whether or not the robot fell over or something like that. That's another example. Um, there's uh, dealing with the state spaces there in a way that, that Carl's been doing it may be a little bit more complicated, though. But in principle, I could just treat that as some function f that I want to optimize. Or recommending ads is, is another example. I want to really look at uh, uh, someone and say, OK, what is the expected number of times they click on some ad when I present it to them? Or let's say I present them a sequence of ads. So I really could keep going, because this really is any function that I'm trying to optimize. So any optimization problem. And it really works when uh, those functions that I'm trying to optimize are noisy, or when it's costly to perform this evaluation. And this last example may seem a bit familiar if anyone is uh, familiar with, with sort of the classical bandit setting. In, in, in this setting, what we have is we have k arms. So, and by arms, I'm, I'm really talking about these sort of slot machines here that I'm interested in pulling one of them at each iteration, and I get back some reward. 
And eventually, I'd like to sort of settle upon the single slot machine that's going to give me back the, the best reward when I pull it. So each one of these arms has some associated distribution with it. And so at every round, I'm going to select one of them, pull that arm, and observe the reward I get back. Well, in this setting, each of these arms just really corresponds to one of the uh, inputs of my black box function. So if we talk about the f function that I defined in the previous slide, that's just f of 1 or f of k. So I just have discrete inputs. But it's really the same problem. So the uh, sort of black box or Bayesian optimization problem that I'm going to describe here is the same sort of setting as the bandit setting. OK, so I'm, now what I'm going to talk about is sort of this general optimization strategy. And what we can really do is if we talk about sort of the bandit strategy that, that, uh, that I introduced in the previous slide, sort of what I can look at is at every round, I just have some function, some acquisition function, alpha, that is dependent on my data the data that I've previously collected by, uh, by interacting with the actual function f, or my noisy observations of the function f. And alpha is some function of that previous data and my input space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this alpha function, which I'm going to define it in a second here, but it should be something that is easy to evaluate, as opposed to my hard to evaluate function f. I'm going to maximize that. Once I maximize that, then I just sample that point, I record my data, and I churn through this over and over. Okay. So really what I've done is I've rewritten this in terms of some new acquisition function, some new strategy uh, that I can talk about optimizing. And really what this function here should be is it should be high in areas that we expect the maximum to be in. But it should also force us to explore the space so we don't sort of inadvertently miss out on looking in areas where the, uh, where the actual function could be high. I just decided not to look there. Um, and as should be evident from the, uh, the, the sort of title of this slide, uh, I'm going to use a, uh, a, a Bayesian model to inform what this acquisition strategy should be. But really, I, I could use anything, right? Well, in principle, I could use anything right there. Whether or not it actually performs well will really depend on what I define this acquisition function to be. So here's an example. And here's what I, why I was saying I, I'm not really going to talk about this in terms of a Bayesian model. I'm, I'm sort of going to just say, well, I've got some model. Uh, and it happens to be a Bayesian posterior, and it happens to be a Gaussian process. But it could really be any sort of model that quantifies my, my uncertainty in space. So here, what I'm using is a uh, Gaussian process posterior. I've, I've sampled the function at this single point right here that, that I'm uh, noting, this, this blue cross. And uh, I have this acquisition function that's defined like this. And this, in particular, happens to be the expected improvement acquisition function. OK, so just as a, a uh, better example of this, uh, I can actually run this. Um, so this is just the same sort of model. And um, this is uh, running right now. So hope my noise is relatively small. So hopefully, there won't be any problems here. But so I've, I've sampled at this single point. This point was chosen randomly. And then this is my acquisition function down below. And it is peaked at this point right here. So that red cross is the next point that I'm going to evaluate. And, and so I'll evaluate that function, update my posterior, um, and, and then recompute my acquisition function. And then I'll, I'll continue this process. Um, and I'll be able to look at where it's high and just continue this process. So what we see is that after a couple of iterations, sort of this point right here is going to turn out to be where the maximum is. 
But I I've, I've, will have tried that a couple of times, but I'm still eventually going to try other points in the space in order to uh, um, make sure that I'm not missing out on some big peak that's over here that I just haven't seen yet. But once I try this a few times, I'll sort of go back to that location right there to sort of zoom in on where I think the actual optimum is. And so, um, however, I, I, I did point out that what a good acquisition function is, is sort of up in the air. The expected improvement acquisition function, it actually works reasonably well, but you'll see here one of the sort of deficiencies of it. Um, it tends to get very, very peaked with uh, plateaus that are pretty much zero throughout the space once you've sort of done enough exploration. Um, but if it's a high dimensional space, there can be large areas with, with sort of plateaus at zero and then peaked regions around either areas that are where you think the optimum are or areas that you haven't explored. So the, the acquisition function itself is sometimes uh, difficult to optimize. But so we'll, we can keep doing this a couple times and eventually I'll have tried it enough right here that I'm very confident the optimum is right here. So maybe I'll go back and start exploring areas where, I'm less, where I have less confidence in them. OK. So, um, so that was just one particular acquisition function. Um, there are a few other interesting acquisition functions I wanted to point out. Uh, one of them uh, is, is sort of been popularized by uh, Phil Hennig and some colleagues recently. Um, and that's entropy search. And basically the idea behind that is that we can define a distribution over where we believe the uh, maximum to be. And then we can look at the change in entropy of, of that particular distribution based on the points that we, um, we sample. So uh, one of the difficulties with this is that it's very, very hard to compute this. So there are a number of different um, approximations one has to make for this. But it has this interesting property where we can compare um, functions even for things that we're not interested in. So for example, this has been used recently in the setting of, of hyperparameter optimization where we might have, um, by, uh, also by Jasper, um, where we have a setting where maybe we uh, can evaluate the function on, let's say, 200 points but we're really interested in the setting where we want to uh, test on, let's say, a million points or some very large data set. So what we can really do is look at hyperparameters, hyperparameters that we're tuning for some machine learning algorithm and test them on uh, scenarios with low amounts of data a couple of times to sort of get information. And we can really zoom in on things with uh, large amounts of data. And the algorithm can trade off between these two types of scenarios. So another interesting approach is Thompson sampling, which basically takes that same distribution I talked about. It's a distribution over where the algorithm believes the maxima is. And that's a, a posterior distribution given our current data. And it takes a single sample from this posterior, maximizes that single sample, and then returns the argmax of that. So it's actually quite related to uh, entropy search. One of the interesting things about this is it's often quite easy to take a sample from that posterior distribution. And, uh, and in fact, so uh, one of the interesting things about uh, this particular algorithm is that, uh, uh, it, is that um, we just have to take that sample. So it actually, um, if we want to look at more complicated posterior models, it may fit up quite nicely with some of the things that people have been talking about in probabilistic programming languages today, where if we just have a language where we can specify models and then take samples from them, that is the only thing that Thompson sampling needs. And it actually performs quite well. Um, one of the troubles is uh, when the co if we have some rich covariance structure, um, often, uh, if this covariance is sort of informative enough, uh, many of these different approaches have sort of uh, uh, similar empirical performance. And it's sometimes difficult to uh, choose between them uh, which method will perform best. And it often shifts with different problem instances. Um, one strategy that, that we've taken is sort of a, 
uh, as someone said earlier today, a, a, a kitchen sinks type approach is just take a bunch of these different acquisition strategies and throw them all at the problem. Now, we can only evaluate one particular, one particular acquisition strategy at a time. And so what we, do, what we did in this scenario was, so here we have our posterior model, and there the uh, different acquisition strategies. We select one of them based on its previous performance, at, where its previous performance we would hope is a predictor of how well it were, will perform on, on the function we're interested in. And, and then we use that to select a particular acquisition function and uh, actually evaluate the point that's recommended by that. One of the imp interesting properties we found, though, is that uh, this will actually mix over different acquisition strategies. And it doesn't necessarily even settle on a particular one. So in fact, um, here I'm showing for one single run this mix of portfolios over different acquisition strategies. Um, generally, the red one and the yellow one uh, tend to, and this is the, the, basically the probability, at, the width gives the probability at each iteration that we choose a particular strategy. Uh, the red one and the yellow one tended to perform better on their own because uh, they, they sort of did more exploration, whereas the green one was sort of more exploitative. However, when we mixed over these different strategies, uh, we, we, we tended to see that the green one still got picked with a, with a high probability because now the entire algorithm itself was mixing over this exploration and exploitation. And the fact that the green one tended to exploit more sort of wasn't to the portfolio's uh, detriment. So now I wanted to highlight a few sort of uh, problems with uh, Bayesian optimization. So in, in the model I talked about earlier, I, uh, I vaguely mentioned that I was using a uh, Gaussian process prior over functions in order to, uh, to uh, select my points x. That, that was my prior over functions. OK, so often, however, the posterior models here have hyperparameters. And whereas with uh, Gaussian process regression, we can often just uh, fit these using the marginal likelihood. However, that's really a bad idea here, um, simply because there's not enough data. So in the, uh, the example I had right here, if I just cancel that and run it again, at the beginning, I really just have one data point. So trying to fit the marginal likelihood, as, as you can well imagine, with one data point is a, a horrible idea that you shouldn't do. So, one thing we can do is, uh, is put a, a hyper prior over these prior parameters and, and sample them. So uh, when we sample the hyper parameters of the model that we're using, um, one of the things, is, one of the problems with that is that this can also be costly. So for GPs, we have to evaluate the marginal likelihood. And as we um, get more and more data points, that gets more and more costly. So another thing we can do is we can, uh, and this is sort of one of the, the problems I wanted to highlight, is that um, maybe we can make some sort of approximations to this. So sort of with the, um, uh, the uh, Fourier features that were brought up earlier, or with the uh, sparse GP um, uh, approaches, like the Fitzy approach that uh, Snelson and, and, and Zubin uh, worked on, or the variational approaches to, that um, Lawrence and others have done. Um, that might be a good way to do this sort of approximation when we're sampling. Bandit methods have also suggested that maybe we, not necessarily that we want to overestimate our, our uncertainty, but that we want to make sure that we don't underestimate it, so that we always get a, an um, over approximation of this. Uh, and and that, what, whether that's the right thing to do as well is another open question. So I alluded to this in the previous slide. And um, one of the things I would really like to do is to be able to take this algorithm uh, and run it for uh, a million iterations. But in, in the background here, I have a Gaussian process that I'm using to uh, fit my model. Um, and so this grows as we add more data. So, getting a Gaussian process with a million data points really is, is not feasible. So these can obviously be updated incrementally as we get uh, one data point at a time. But if we sample the hyperparameters, that really gets thrown out at every iteration. So again, 
the question is, in this sort of setting, what are the, the sort of uh, smart approximation methods we can do to, uh, and, and how should these feed into the, uh, the model that we're working with here um, in order to get sort of uh, uh, approximations to the sort of expected improvement or, or something like that. Um, and I'll skip over this, but there are some things we can say about the convergence of these methods. Uh, you can definitely say that eventually a Bayesian optimization method will converge to the truth, but that's really not an interesting result because, you know, it's purely asymptotic. Um, banded algorithms have sort of uh, uh, similar sort of things that they can say, and there are some things that you can say about sort of Bayesian bandits and Bayesian optimization methods, um, but definitely there's some more work that needs to be done there. Um, so I think I'm pretty much out of time. Uh, so I'll, I'll just leave this up here. That's sort of just a summary of the interesting sub-problems that I would really hope someone solves and uh, questions, if you have any. Thank you.